Let us confess our sins to God and prepare ourselves to may worthily participate in this holy sacrifice. We gather today on an absolutely gorgeous sun, uh, summer Sunday morning. I welcome you here. I know on a gorgeous Sunday summer morning there's so many other things to do, uh, but you have made the time to come here to Mass. And, and uh, that says a lot about your faith and your relationship to church. And so thank you for being here. Uh, last night, um, I don't want to embarrass him, but the Gir there the Girardi. Uh, there's like 20,000 people at Tanglewood last year yesterday to uh, see Garrison Keillor's last show there, uh, Prairie Home Companion. You may listen to it on the radio. It's on uh, public radio every uh, Saturday from 6 to 8. So there's like 20,000 people. I do not know how they found us, but they saw Sharon and I uh, over there. So we met up at, um, at uh, Tanglewood last night. Beautiful. Uh, when that show goes off air at 8 p.m., he still played for another hour and a half afterwards. And, and he is such, he's just such a nice guy. He's got a good soul and a good spirit. And I'm really going to miss hearing his voice on those Prairie Home Companions after the season <clears throat> ends this year. Uh, but I, I'm very thankful for people like that. You know, they just have so much goodness that it kind of, it, it, it just spreads. And that whole group of people, you know, to get into Tangle, if you've ever gone there, you have to fight traffic. And when you're in those cars, you know, you, you're just not too happy with the ones that are all around you. And all of a sudden, when you get there at Tanglewood, and it just makes everybody feel good, and you just like other people. And uh, it, it's just a nice experience. And, and I hope somehow a little bit of church is that same tier of feeling that, well, you don't have to fight the throngs and the traffic coming here. Uh, but once you get here, I do hope you have that same kind of feeling that this is a nice place to be, and that this is a good community of people to be among. And so as we do gather as that people of God this Sunday morning, I ask you to please make a private examination of your conscience. Receive our prayer. For you alone are holy. 
Lord be with you.
Spirit, you are not under the law. And that's from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Back in the very, very early 2000s, Charles Schultz drew an amazing penis cartoon strip that in only eight little panels captured the essential difference between the spirit and the law. So rerun, and I had to go look up on the internet what his name is. Rerun, that's Linus' younger brother. He's coloring excitedly in school. Hands are flying with delight, and he's saying out loud, more action, more color. The girl sitting, sitting at the table next to him informs him matter-of-factly, we're supposed to be painting flowers today. I don't do flowers, answers the young boy. I do underground comics. See, here's Billy Jean King and Daffy Duck, and they're throwing Long John Silver off a pirate ship. I have big plans for my work. He then approaches the teacher's desk, the adult, the authoritarian. Holding up his unique pirate drawing to share his dreams, he says, yes, ma'am, these will be consecutively numbered, limited edition prints. Each print will be signed and accompanied by a certificate of authentication. Then all you see is a dejected rerun, answering the teacher by saying, Yes, ma'am, I understand. He returns to the table where that little girl is still sitting. He gets back, sits down. She asks, What did she say? Not even looking up, head bowed, the dejected rerun says, Today we're painting flowers. <laughs> So the story goes, from childhood through maturity, creativity is in a constant battle with wretched, and the spiritual is not walled off in this competition. Creative, excitement, enthusiasm, wretched, doing what we have to do. We met this past week to discuss a book about the woman apostle Julia, who is mentioned at the end of the epistle to the Romans, Paul's like premier work, and there she is, the apostle Julia, a woman. Her example is one of creative exuberance, and that walked right smack into a wall of wretchedness. The book talks about the fact that there were once paintings of Julia, and later on people came along and they took her face and they drew like a, a beard on it to make the woman into a man. They did all kinds of things in written form and in picture form to make sure that, that creativity in the early church, it didn't look so creative anymore. It just kind of fit into the regimen of ancient society. But the author of the book, he did make several references to important religious thinkers throughout Christian history who have been inspired by the epistle to the Romans. This is Paul's formal, defining explanation, explanation of his theology, and it is a wonderful read. But my favorite, personal favorite, Pauline writing is the epistle to the Galatians. And that's the one we just read from, that's the one we have been reading from on Sunday morning. It is often uncensored. It is Paul speaking to us without the filter of time. It's almost a stream of consciousness writing. Romans is like a letter that someone sits down to write, and then they set it aside. They think again about what they're saying, and then eventually they decide, I'm going to put that in the mail, and off it goes. Galatians, on the other hand, is an emotional email that is sent out right in the heat of the moment. You're not always happy that you did that. And I don't know if Galatians is always something that Paul was happy he said later, but it really lets you into the feelings of Paul without the filter of theology and thinking. And one of his essential concerns is very adamant that Christianity is about freedom. Paul battles throughout his apostleship with other leaders of the church who want to impose, again, law over those earliest Christians of the Spirit. And Paul, speaking in the name of the risen Christ, refuses to compromise. And that anger comes out. You can see it and hear it in Galatians. We hear part of his battle cry this morning when we read, For freedom, Christ has set us free. That was that whole 1960s movement for civil rights down south. For freedom, Christ has set us free. So stand firm and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. That's what Christianity was. It was freedom. It was exuberance. It was enthusiasm. For Paul, freedom is the spirit, and slavery is commandment, doing what we have to do, what we're told to do. We have to paint flowers today. Freedom, he says, however, can never be an excuse for self-indulgence. Freedom means letting the spirit 
Remember, we're created in the image and likeness of God, so our spirit looks like God's spirit. So when the God spirit comes into our spirit, we start to become who we really are. And that is not about selfishness, because the spirit is God, and God is anything but selfish. So this is how Paul condenses the 613 Old Testament laws and even Jesus' two commands of love. He takes all of that and he puts it into one single statement. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's everything that you have to do to be a Christian. The God stuff comes in naturally. That's something that you do because you want to do because your spirit and God's spirit are the same. You love that union. You feel good about it. But the hard thing to do is love your neighbor as yourself. So this allows room for all kinds of creativity to do that, to live in the spirit, all kinds of circumstances, all kinds of times, all kinds of different annoying people. And people in the freedom of the spirit can practice their faith any way that they wish, differently, uniquely, and that in turn allows them to respect that in somebody else too. And that's what I was kind of talking about when you go up to Tango and you sit there with all those people and Garrison Keillor just makes you feel good. You know, he makes you feel good about it. He sings patriotic songs. He makes you feel good about being American. He sings religious songs constantly. We ended last night with him singing the doxology that we're going to sing at the end of Mass. He sings religious songs, and it's not that thing, you know, where you have to do these things. It, just, it comes out of the spirit. You want to do these, and that's what Paul is talking about. Think back to this morning's gospel as well. The passage we shared is a fundamental transition point in Luke's writing. Here, in the middle of chapter 9, Luke's Jesus, quote, resolutely determines to journey to Jerusalem. Ten chapters later, he finally arrives, and we all know the story of what happens when he gets there. But those ten chapters, from 9 to 19, they tell of the culmination of Jesus' ministry and teaching, and they begin with an uncommon story in Luke of the disciples' failure. Luke does not like to say things that are bad about the disciples. But I think he includes this one because of the nearly universal application. Jesus and the disciples enter a village, and they meet with resistance. They are not welcome there. Then the seemingly natural response of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, is conveyed when they turn to Jesus and they ask. They almost demand. They already think they know the answer. And they say to Jesus, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and consume them? In Jesus' words, must have been such a surprise to those two and the other ten as well. Rather than joining in the condemnation of those who were opposed to their ministry, Jesus rebukes his own disciples. Faith can never be imposed, says Jesus. Faith can never be enforced. Church is not supposed to be about <coughs> condemnation. Faith is something that should be a joyful message. It is the good news. It is supposed to be embraced if it is to be authentic. And that's the difference between obeying the law and living in the Spirit. We are part of that Spirit of God, and what we have inside of us wants to live in the Spirit. And for anyone who imagines that Christian freedom is going to be easier than following the law, that we can do whatever we want, whenever we want, we next hear from Jesus about commitment. And some of the statements are uttered in the extreme to make the point absolutely clear. To the one who wants to become a follower of Jesus, but must first bury his father, Jesus replies, let the dead bury their dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. To bury the dead is a sacred religious responsibility. And Jesus says, even that, let them <coughs> take care of them, and you go do what you need to do to proclaim the kingdom of God. This is said in the extreme. Freedom does not mean hobby. It doesn't mean doing it when we want to do it. Freedom means letting the Spirit guide us and to do all that the Spirit wishes. That can't be regulated by any rules of any law. It has to be embraced and lived with enthusiasm. And before we start imagining that it is absolutely impossible to live in this way, we have to remember that the Spirit is, first of all, helping us. We also need to consider the alternative. Paul is absolutely right when he warns, as we heard from Mary Ellen today when she read it, about the rush of condemnation that is too often a part of religious law. His words are prophetic. But if you go on biting and devouring one another, beware that you are not consumed by one another. How many times and how many ways and how many headlines 
do we need to hear that the one who lives by the sword dies by the sword? There is only so much security gain by constantly trying to attack and kill opponents and enemies and to downgrade anybody who disagrees with us. At some point, we are going to have to find a way to simply live with one another. That hope can't be legislated, it can't be enforced, it has to be embraced freely by people who recognize that there is but one single commandment from God. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So may we give this message a chance to take root in our lives and in our communities on this beautiful summer Sunday morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty Lord, as we gather before your altar on this beautiful day that you have given to us as a gift, we offer our prayers in loving memory of Jacob Gormalo, who passed away on June 9th, as offered by Clifford Thatcher and Natalie Gardner. We offer our prayers in loving memory of Gus Perfido, who passed away on June 23rd of 2001, as offered by the Orlowski and the Perfido family. We offer our prayers for Helen Pislusky on the 21st anniversary of her death, June 14th. We offer prayers for the health of Brandon Poe, as offered by the uh, Foster family. And we also have a prayer for Brandon and his family, that they will be safe and healthy, as offered by Tammy LaFleur. We offer our prayers for Staff Sergeant James Pigeon and the rest of the Marines and sailors deployed with the 22nd Marine Expeditionary Unit as offered by Beth and Bob Powell. We also offer prayers on uh, this past week with the anniversary of death of Sharon's, mo of Sharon's mother, Anita Wisniewski. We offer prayers for her. We also continue to offer our prayers for all of those battling cancer. Doug Robinson, by uh, daughter Jenny Whitman and Karen Ersick. Meg Connors, by Ellen and Don Trotsky. Carl Dickinson, by Joe and Peg Ustra. Randy Clements by her grandmother, Dottie Barones, fathers Ray Greta, Jan Gilcha, and Maurice Lizell, is offered by myself, and also Frank Sprosky, is offered by Don, uh, his twin brother, Sprosky Gates, and Kirk and Dolly Sands. Are there any other prayers that you would like to offer at this time to the congregation? Mark? I'd like to offer a prayer for the victims of the floods in West Virginia and the fires in California. It's devastating. Okay, so the floods in West Virginia and the fires out. Oh, okay, thank you very much. I see a hand. I, oh, EJ? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for Anne's cousin, Amy Oshifa, tomorrow will be the 17th anniversary of her passing. She was 17 at the time when she passed away. 17 year old. Okay, Amy Oshifa. Arianna, you want to inform us? Um, you got some good news, right? Want to say a little prayer of thanks? Yes, a prayer of thanks for Brandon. Um, he came home from the hospital yesterday. That's a much nicer Sunday today. So we'll offer prayer for Brandon as well. For all of these prayers, Lord, plus the private ones that we keep in our memory and bring before you, plus we ask that you to bless all of us here at Gavin, uh, to also be with those who are parish who are unable to be with us here today, and those who are parish who have chosen not to be with us here today. <coughs> for these things together, Lord, we pray by name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us in the Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord. May they rest in peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in one God. God, 
everywhere to give you thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through his cross and resurrection, he freed us from sin and death and called us to the glory that has made us a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people set apart. Everywhere we proclaim your mighty word, for you have called us out of darkness into your own wonderful light. Therefore the angels and archangels, with all the saints and the entire church, we lift our hymn of praise to your glory, repeating unceasingly. Testament of the new and eternal testament, the 
mystery of faith, which for you and for many shall be shed for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you shall do these things, do them in remembrance of me. Wherefore, mindful Lord, we your servants, as also your faithful people, in remembrance of this Christ, your Son and our Lord, is also his pleasant passion, the resurrection and his glorious ascension. We receive from your own gifts and presents a true offering, a holy offering, an immaculate offering, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of eternal salvation. <coughs> These gifts we receive with a joyful countenance, as from him who is the giver of all temporal and eternal good gifts, and with an unshakable faith that he will become for our souls the saving remedy. We humbly beseech you, Almighty God, grant that our prayers be borne by the hand of your holy angel to your highest altar before the countenance of your divine majesty. That as many of us as receive this altar, most sacred body and blood of your Son, may be filled with every blessing and grace through Christ our Lord. Amen. Be mindful also, Lord, of your servants and handmaids, all who have gone before us with the sign of faith and who have passed on to eternity. To these souls, O Lord, and this also to those who have died in Christ, to grant everlasting life, and to those who during life strayed from the path of righteousness, unmindful of your father and love, Mercifully shorten their sufferings, we beseech you, in the name of Christ our Lord, and your beloved Son. And grant us, your sinful servants, who hope for the greatness of your mercy, some part of fellowship with your holy apostles, fathers of all your saints, who shed their blood for your name's sake, whose hearts are always open to justice and mercy, and whose lives patterned after the divine Master, merit an eternal bliss. Number us, O Lord, in their company, with confidence we ask you, not because of our merits, but that you bestow forgiveness through Christ our Lord, by whom, O oh Lord, these gifts you always create, sanctify, revive, <coughs> bless, and bestow upon us all these good things. Through him, and with him, and in him, and to you, God the Father Almighty, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and all glory. Throughout all ages of ages. Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
ever one God. Throughout all ages of ages, Shall I return unto the Lord? For all the grace that he has rendered unto me. I will take the chalice of salvation, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. I pray so I call upon the Lord, and I shall be saved from all my enemies. May the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ preserve my soul unto life everlasting. Amen. takes away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy. You should enter into my heart, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Lord, I am not worthy. You should enter into my heart, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Lord, I am not worthy. You should enter into my heart, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
Father, to our hearing of your word and our reception of this holy Eucharist, may we be strengthened to put aside all that deters us from you. Give us the grace to faithfully follow your Son, that we may be worthy for the kingdom of heaven. We ask us through the same Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Father's only Son, full of grace and of truth. 